Rolling Stone Magazine's Continuous History of Rock and Roll, Volume 1, Number 33. This week's chapter is Part 2 of our look at one of the most important music cities in the world. I'm Gary Bridges. When we return, it's the music of the Jefferson Starship. Santana. Credence Clearwater Revival. Journey. And a lot more in part two of The Sound of San Francisco. Starting in the 60s, the city of San Francisco and surrounding Bay Area communities hatched some of the world's most important rockers. When you flash on San Francisco, names like Slick, Ballin, Garcia, and others come to mind. The Bay Area is so musically aware and proud of it that the Bay Area Musicians Association gets together every year and gives its top local artists awards they call BAMIs. It's quite a music scene, and today we'll dig a little deeper into the whys and hows of the sound of San Francisco. The Jefferson Starship, a band whose roots go all the way back to the beginning of the San Francisco rock eruption. I left my heart. Just 
San Francisco. The first British invasion convinced young people everywhere that they could put together bands like the Beatles and Stones. In San Francisco, Marty Ballon was an actor and folk musician. He started a band with Paul Kantner and Signe Tolley. They added drums, bass, and guitar, and called it the Jefferson Airplane. Once the lineup was set, Ballon started looking for places to play. Well, when I started the Jefferson Airplane, I realized there was no place for us to play. So I went out and conned three people that used to come watch me sing all the time. They told me they had $3,000 each, so I conned them out of it. Told them I would put together a band and build a club, and they could have the club and I'll take the band. So they gave me the money, and I built the club. The Matrix was really the first of the clubs that gave musicians a chance to develop. But Ballon didn't have time to run it. He was too busy touring and making hit records with the airplane. The airplane really took off in 1966 when they added Grace Slick. With Slick and Ballon out front on vocals, they became the first big San Francisco band. Ballon quit the band he helped form in 1971 and returned to the Starship in 74, only to leave it again to go solo. <laughs> Grace Slick dropped out of the Starship in the late 70s after a tour of Europe, but she too returned in 1981, just in time to sing on some of the tracks from Modern Times. Starship lead guitarist Craig Chikiso tells us Grace liked the new sound of the Starship, and she wanted to be part of it. She just really uh, liked the music we were doing, and I guess more than that, she liked uh, the feeling within the band, just the, the energy between all the musicians. It was just real cohesive now, you know, for a change, I guess, because for a time there when... Uh, well, when Grace was still in the group and Marty was in the band, we were really divided between what um, some people in the band wanted to do and what the rest of the band wanted to do. But then when Grace came to his sessions and found out, you know, what we were into now, and she could really sense the fact that, hey, this is a rock and roll band again. Everybody's, you know, right there and focused. But she asked to, could be okay if she sang on a few songs. <laughs> we said, well, let's think about it. No, we said, hey, great.
Stranger, a duet by Starship singers Mickey Thomas and Grace Slick from the album Modern Times. About the time the Jefferson Airplane was getting started, a group called Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions was having fun, but finding that getting work doing bluegrass and jug band music was tough. The band included Jerry Garcia, Bob Weir, and Ron Pigpen McKernan. Well, gradually, a friend persuaded them that they had to go electric. When they did, they added Phil Lesh on bass and Bill Kreutzman on drums. In the summer of 1965, the Warlocks made their debut. Of course, the rock world knows them better today as the Grateful Dead. Now, over 15 years later, the Grateful Dead continue as leading cult figures in one of the original psychedelic San Francisco bands. They've been followed around the world by deadheads, their adoring fans. And with a hit album, Go to Heaven, in 1980, the Dead made millions of new fans. Jerry Garcia, founding father of the Dead, says the new fans are the same as the old, just in a different time frame. The kind of people that they are is the same kind of people that our audience, I think, has probably always been. The difference is that the setting that they're occurring in is this world, the world of the 80s, which is a significantly different world than the world of, say, the 60s or the 70s. It, it, it works. There's a communication there that I, I sense. I, I don't feel that our audience being youthful, for example, is any uh, disadvantage to them in terms of their, are they digging it? I think that their ability to assimilate everything that's going on and to, to add their own personal energy and so forth to the situation is, has, there's quite a lot of integrity there. Driving that train, how cocaine, Casey Jones, you better watch your speed. Trouble ahead, trouble behind And you know that notion just crossed my mind This old dungeon makes it on time Leaves Central Station about a quarter to nine at Trevor Junction at 17 to at a quarter to ten you know it's traveling again driving that train I'm cocaine Casey Jones you better watch your speed trouble ahead trouble behind and you know that notion just crossed my mind Thank you. 
eyes, but you still don't see. Come round the bend, you know it's the end. The fire lord screams, and the engine just gleams. Driving that train, I'm cocaine. Casey Jones, better watch your speed. Trouble ahead, trouble behind. And you know that notion just crossed my mind. Driving that train, I'm cocaine. Casey Jones, better watch your speed. Just cross my mind Driving that train Out cocaine Case the told you grip Watch your speed Trouble ahead Trouble behind And you know that ocean Just cross my mind Driving that train Out cocaine Case the told you grip Watch your Trouble ahead, you know, trouble behind And you know that notion just crossed my mind And you know that notion just crossed my mind The Grateful Dead, still rocking after 17 years on Rolling Stone Magazine's Continuous History of Rock and Roll. Next, we'll hear from Santana and two bands that grew out of it. This is the continuous history of rock and roll and part two of The Sound of San Francisco. In the mid-60s, the scene in San Francisco was ripe for any kind of experimenting. LSD was legal in California at the time and people experimented with that. The Beatles had pushed the technology of making records way ahead with Sgt. Pepper, and people were playing with new styles and recording techniques. And in the late 60s, a young Mexican guitar player named Carlos Santana mixed a Latin feel with basic rock and came up with the sound of Santana. The first Santana band, which included keyboard player Greg Raleigh, started playing in the Mission section of San Francisco, a heavily Spanish area. Word spread about an incredible band, and by 1968, Santana was headlining at the famous Fillmore Auditorium. In 1969, the band included Carlos, Raleigh, Dave Brown, Michael Carbello, Jose Arias, and a 17-year-old drummer named Michael Shreve. This is the lineup that played at Woodstock, where the world learned about Santana. Through the years, Carlos Santana has taken lots of directions with his music, especially jazz. But every so often, he comes back with another chart-topping hit. What are his thoughts today about the sounds of San Francisco? It was significant. Musically, it was fantastic. It just became like a rainbow. It just All the colors just started mingling with each other. Ideals, philosophy. Uh, you know. So that's why it was, it was significant.
songs by Santana, their first hit, Evil Ways, and more recently winning from the Z-Bop album on the continuous history of rock and roll. With all the stylistic changes Santana's gone through, it's only natural that personnel changes would be frequent, too. Greg Raleigh, the original keyboard player for Santana, forms his own band with Neil Schoen in 1974 called Journey. After a few false starts, the band sounds solidified around the voice of Steve Perry. Perry says he's lucky his voice held up through all the years of grueling tours and the handful of albums. There's so many things I want to do with my voice, and it's nice that it's, it's, it's working out and it, that my voice is, is able to do some of the things vocally I want to do. There's a lot of things I can't do yet I'm still working on, you know, but there's a lot of things I'm glad I can pull off because it makes me feel like I'm not too limited and I, you know, you're, my resources are, are there at my availability. It's nice.
Journey from the Top 5 Album Escape on Rolling Stone Magazine's Continuous History of Rock and Roll. Santana's influence carries way beyond the roots of Journey. Early in Santana's history, Carlos took a chance on a young kid who asked to play with the band. 17-year-old Michael Shreve went on to become the focal point of the long Santana segment in the Woodstock movie, the piece that earned Santana worldwide acclaim. Today, Shreve is keeping the beat for the exciting new band, Novo Combo. Novo Combo, a band whose rhythmic roots go back to the sound of San Francisco. We'll continue with Creedence Clearwater Revival and the composer of a Rick Springfield hit right after this. I'm Gary Bridges, and this is the sound of San Francisco. Ooh, I made it to the great and I'll just about to lose. 
When you talk about San Francisco rock, you've got to include the music of Creedence Clearwater Revival. The music of CCR doesn't really sound like San Francisco acid rock, but Credence was reaching for a different sound, and that fit right in with the mood of other San Francisco bands. At a time when rock was favoring long, drawn-out jams and improvisation, Credence was recording short, danceable rock. When bands were experimenting with Indian and Latin rhythms, CCR was playing straightforward American rock and roll. And while rock was getting sophisticated and arty, Creedence Clearwater Revival was doing rockabilly. It seemed like they were going directly against the flow, but between 1969 and 1971, Creedence had 15 songs in the top 10. The first hit single by Creedence Clearwater Revival on the continuous history of rock and roll. John and Tom Fogarty, Stu Cook, and Doug Clifford started playing in high school in the late 50s. They did the local scene as the Blue Velvets and the Gollywogs before they settled on Creedence Clearwater Revival in 1967. The band was built on solid playing and the brilliant writing of John Fogarty. And before they broke up in July of 1972, they were called the best American rock and roll band of their time. Ground. Could be a truly hatred 
Creedence Clearwater Revival on Rolling Stone Magazine's Continuous History of Rock and Roll. Rock and roll and rock and rollers continue to grow in the Bay Area in a wide variety of styles. Today in San Francisco, you'll find modern rock groups like Romeo Void and heavy metal artists like Sammy Hagar. Hagar's roots go back to the mid-70s as lead singer with Montrose. The idea of that band was Ronnie play guitar, period. Denny play drums, period. Bill Church play bass, period. I sing, period. That's it, you know. Every guy's got their own job, can't be any ego trips. But I was always a guitar player. <laughs> and I started getting where I wanted to play guitar. You know, I just started getting on my own little ego trip where I wanted to write my own songs and I wanted to play guitar and I wanted to kind of just go off my own direction and in other words I wanted to lead the band <laughs> and you know I came down it was Ronnie's band and I was I was in the wrong in that respect so I just figured well uh, if I want to do what I want to do I'm going to have to leave I'm about to rock the nation Since he's gone solo, Sammy Hagar has distinguished himself as an intense performer on stage. It all comes out on stage. I get it out. You know, I get it off and I go, all right. You know, it's really getting off. It's like having sex. And uh, it's addicting. <laughs> it's just, it's like being addicted to something. Uh, if you don't get to make a record or if I don't write a good song or get on stage for a long period of time, it just bundles up inside me, man. I could... I'd probably be a murderer. <laughs> I'd commit murders or something. I don't know. And as a composer, with his new album Standing Hampton riding high on the charts. He also wrote the song that Rick Springfield made a hit called I've Done Everything For You. Here's a taste of the Sammy Hagar version on the continuous history of rock and roll.
Sammy Hagar, one of the new breed of San Francisco artists. When we come back, we'll have a final thought from Marty Ballin. All across the nation, such a strange vibration. Jefferson Airplane founder Marty Ballin grew up on San Francisco's famous Hate Street. He sums up the San Francisco scene for the continuous history of rock and roll. It was a fabulous time. I mean, you know, you name the greats and they were there and we all played together and we all put on shows. We were speaking for saving the world, saving the planet. Uh, music was a real viable leader in, in the movement and, you know, it, it spread. The uh, free gig spread all the way to Woodstock. We had places to play. We had ballrooms, all these ballrooms. We had all these artists who were involved in a new thing called uh, they had light shows in and the psychedelia came about youth flocked there today we've gotten another slant on the sound of san francisco in future chapters we'll hear more from credence journey sly stone and the new groups who'll be shaping the continuous history of rock and roll what song is it you want to hear the continuous history of rock and roll is produced by denny somak and rd Steele for rolling stone magazine productions if you'd like to write us, send it to 745 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10151, or in care of this station. I'm Gary Bridges. Be sure to join us next week when Rolling Stone magazine explores another chapter in the continuous history of rock and roll.